Buonasera a tutti, siamo qui oggi a uno degli incontri che anticipano e preparano Book City Milano. Con grande piacere do il benvenuto a Escol Nevo, autore notissimo, amatissimo in Italia, tant'è che i suoi libri escono sempre in Italia come prima lingua di traduzione nel mondo dopo l'uscita in Israele. Cito solo alcuni dei tuoi titoli più famosi, La simmetria dei desideri, L'ultima intervista, Tre piani, da cui recentemente è stato tratto il film per la regia di Nanni Moretti che è stato presentato a Cannes. E quindi io co co sono molto contenta di averti qui oggi per poter un po' attraversare quello che è il tuo lavoro di scrittore, anche se è sempre difficile poi trovare i fil rouge che attraversano l'opera di uno scrittore senza fare torto poi a tutte le deviazioni, i cambi di, di prospettiva, di punti di vista che, che attraversano la tua opera. Però io credo che qualcosa si possa dire che, che torna e, e che è sempre presente nei tuoi libri e sono dei, dei campi che tu vai a esplorare o delle ossessioni e sicuramente una se dovessi ridurla in una parola è il desiderio quello che significa per noi il desiderio, il potere che ha nelle nostre vite e dall'altro l'elemento della verità, in che rapporto sta la verità e la menzogna non solo nelle storie che raccontiamo e ci raccontiamo ma anche nella costruzione della nostra identità. Vorrei partire da quest'ultima cosa perché è centrale nel tuo ultimo libro, l'ultima intervista che è la storia appunto di uno scrittore in un momento di crisi che decide per la prima volta di prendere tutte le domande che sono state fatte a lui nella sua carriera di scrittore e rispondere veramente, sul serio. Allora proviamo a rispondere anche noi veramente oggi. Volevo chiederti quanto è importante per te il rapporto con la verità in un'epoca in cui sembra che i lettori siano molto interessati alle storie vere, a sapere quanto c'è di vero nella storia che raccontiamo. Tu invece scrivi fiction, scrivi sempre romanzi. Qual è per te, cosa significa scrivere fiction in un'epoca così ossessionata dalla verità? I understood everything. You don't have to translate. It was beautiful. Uh, my Italian is like really, really getting better. <laughs> yeah, sure, I'm sure, yeah. It was uh, analyzing the, what, are, what current themes are happening in my books and talking about this, and desideri and truth, right? And how important is truth for me? In the, a, a fiction for me in these days of uh, obsession for the truth. Is that true? Yeah? Okay. Um, So, I think uh, I will begin by, uh, by telling you how, how did I realize that I want to be uh, a writer. There's, in La Ultima Intervista, there's one answer to this question, when did you understand, but there's a lot of answers to this question. So, the first time I realized that I want to be a writer was, uh, I was backpacking in South America, and I was uh, writing uh, letters to my girlfriend. She was in Israel and uh, telling her what is happening in this South American trip, like, like telling all the, uh, the events that happens in our trip, um, because I wanted also to maintain the relationship, because she, we were far away. And so long, long letters before email, before WhatsApp, real letters, very long. And then at, at one point, because nothing really happened in the backpacking, I started inventing stuff, like inventing things that did not really happen. And sometimes I would tell my girlfriend, uh, uh, okay, now starts the fiction part. And sometimes I would, I would not tell her, I would just go from nonfiction to fiction and uh, with a very fluent way. And I realized after a while, I think it, it was deep into this uh, uh, journey, that I enjoy more the, the fiction part than the, than the nonfiction part. This is, this is where I find my real joy in writing. You want to translate? Uh, it's afterwards, okay. Um, so I kind of came back with, from this uh, uh, backpacking, it was 1995, I was 20, 25, 26, and I, I came back with the decision that I want to be a professional liar. This is what I want to do in life. And, and it didn't happen, it, it took a while, and I think till this day, you know, I was, I was in, recently I was in Ferrara, Uh, and I had this morning free uh, for writing, and I haven't written for quite a while. And I thought, wow, there's something really interesting happening in, in my real life. Now I want to write about it. Okay, so I start writing about it. Non-fiction, the kind of a journal. And then I, 
without even noticing, I, I started adding stuff that did not happen and, and like bringing on characters from other fields of life. Suddenly an Italian got into the story, <laughs> which was not, not supposed to be there. And, 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 the, and I felt this kind of freedom because when you are, the problem with nonfiction is that you're, you're confined with, with what really happened. And I don't want to be confined. It, for me, writing is, is freedom. So nonfiction liberates me. And also it enables me to write my deepest fears and my deepest fantasies, as if they were true. Um, and, and in that sense, it's not less real, because if you are writing your fantasies and your fears, then you are writing about something which is true. It's, it, it's not historically true, but it's true. It's, it's, it's part of, what, of who you are. And then maybe you also meet the fears and the fantasies of the reader. L'elemento della verità torna anche un po', possiamo forse dire che il cuore è cupo che sta anche sotto al fondo delle storie del tuo libro Tre Piani, che sono tre storie in tre piani diversi di, di un condominio. Abbiamo la storia di un uomo che confessa una sua paura a un ipotetico amico, una donna che scrive a un'amica il suo timore, le, le sue paure inconfessabili e una donna che parlando a una segreteria telefonica alla voce del marito ormai morto si confessa. Mm -hmm. Torna questo elemento della confessione senza che mai il confessore sia nella scena, mm -hmm. si parla a qualcuno che non c'è. Quanto è importante per te questo elemento del, della confessione, del raccontare? È interessante perché la confessione è qualcosa che assume che è is to the truth. If you go to a confession cell in a church and, and the priest is on the other side, you're supposed to tell him the truth. Now, the confessions in this book, in Trepiani, uh, are, are stories. They are manipulative. The, the confessor wants to get something out of his confession. He wants to be maybe uh, forgiven. He wants to be He wants maybe a happy ending written by someone else to his own story. He wants to settle an, un if we were talking about the judge in the third floor, to settle an unsettled business. So it's, it's, confession is pretending to be the authentic truth, but maybe it's just another format of the story. And maybe if we would hear uh, the other side, the other angle, which is always fascinating for me as a writer to think, how would it look from the other side, like in, in the second uh, floor, we have Khani and she's, she's confessing and suddenly at the middle of this floor, she's enabling her husband to react. What would he say if he would read this confession? And then when, he, when she lets him speak, you suddenly understand that, yeah, but maybe she, she's not holding the truth. Uh, she doesn't, uh, she's not a, the dictator of the truth. It's much more democratic. And I think this notion, if you're looking for this red uh, thread that goes through my books, I think this notion of a democratic way of understanding life uh, and that there's always another angle. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I can't, I can't write anything who is completely uh, um, one-sided. I'm not able to do it even if I try. <laughs> Tornando, provando a riprendere un altro filo rosso dei tuoi libri, quello del desiderio. Hai addirittura un libro che mette il desiderio nel titolo, La simmetria dei desideri, dove noi abbiamo, tu racconti mirabilmente questi quattro ragazzi che decidono di scrivere su dei bigliettini quelli che saranno i loro desideri per poi incontrarsi quattro anni dopo, nel momento di nuovo dei mondiali di calcio, per vedere cosa ne sarà dei loro desideri. Quindi, il desiderio è qualcosa di più che un motore della storia per te. Noi viviamo però in una società dove spesso ci viene detto è una società senza desideri. In molti l'hanno scritto, teorizzato. Secondo te co come cambia? Qual è lo spazio reale dei desideri nelle nostre vite? Siamo ancora capaci di desiderare o, o la velocità del mondo in cui siamo esposti da, da internet, ma non è solo quello, la, la velocità in cui si susseguono le scuole, gli eventi, le informazioni, ci rende difficile trovare uno spazio per desiderare. Non a caso è un libro di gioventù, quello in cui il desiderio è più centrale? Uh, I, I think my, my, my passions uh, just became more powerful 
during the years, I'm not less passionate now than I was when I was 28 or 32. Just uh, you know, the, the, maybe the direction of the passion has changed. Maybe they, the, the, the themes are, are changing, but not the energy. Um, I think we look at what happened during, during COVID, during the, the lockdowns, I think. Now in Israel, you see two kinds of phenomena. Uh, I don't know how it is in, in Italy, but you see two kinds of phenomena. You see couples divorcing, and you, see, and you see crazy love stories, passionate, crazy love stories happening, because there was this kind of energy that was blocked for, for, for a long time, and now it's birthed in. And, and it doesn't really matter. And I'm talking about people at the age of 20 and at the age of 60. So I think it's something really basic about being a human being and maybe it's also connected with, to the fact that I come from a very intense country. I, I don't know if you've been to Israel, it's, it's a very intense place. place. Um, sometimes life in Israel seems like fiction, the, the, the level of intensity of events. We had uh, coming out of the second, of the third lockdown, we had a war. We were just able, uh, happy about coming out from the lockdown and the vaccine vaccinations trying to to uh, beginning to affect and then we had a war and then the war ended and it started the, the fourth wave so uh, this is life in israel people are intense with each other very intimate very sometimes aggressive uh, so maybe it's also connected to this I, I you can't really relax and be in a homeostasis uh, in, when you live in israel and Actually, I'm not that sure that I, I would like to be in a homeostasis. Maybe this will be the end of my writing. <laughs> I have nothing to write about. No, no, I don't know if I wish it to myself. Um, and when, when I look at my daughters, they are from, from a different generation. Uh, they're 18 and 15 and 10. These are their ages. And then when I look at my, my uh, older daughters, I, I, they, of course, they are completely into Instagram. And when we were in Rome, they were sharing all the time every experience they had with their friends. And, but basically, they have the same kind of passions that I had when I was 18. They are about love, about being loved, about friends, and, and wanting to be someone in the world. Uh, uh, dreams about uh, changing the world maybe one of them is very political so she wants to change the world and the other wants to be an actor and they have this kind of so i don't know i don't, I don't really feel that it's changing do you feel that it's changing with the students in, in scholar holden a bit yes they're yes. less less passionate not less passionate but less uh, less precise somehow more confused no confused i think You're, when, when I think of, of my of my students in Israel, I, I I would agree that they're confused. But actually, I was confused myself when I was twenty something. I was I had the same. I was breaking up and, and coming back with the same girl for five years. My life was a mess. I tried to work in advertising. I hated it. I tried to study psychology. I understood I don't want to be a psychologist. I, my life was a mess. So I don't feel I can be patronizing them. And I do sense, by the way, I do sense, and this is connected to the other question you asked, the first question, there is a change because of social media, there is a change in a way in writing. And uh, I, sometimes uh, I, I feel that we are striving with our students, with our young students to convince them that if they published a text on Instagram or on Facebook and they got a lot of likes and uh, it's it doesn't mean that they finished the work on the text this is challenge number one and challenge challenge, challenge number two is that they write a lot about themselves in first person what i did today who broke my heart and then it's a, a real challenge to to kind of take them to this journey of widening their their scope and and where do I live? What, what is the society around me? What, how does it look from another angle? My, my, my heart was broken, but how does the other side feel? I think this is part of the, like a new challenge that we have with, uh, with the new generation. 
Pensavo citavi il tempo che abbiamo passato nell'ultimo anno e mezzo, due anni, costretti da lockdown, uscite e varie cose. Il tema che guiderà quest'anno il Festival di Book City sarà il dopo. dopo. Cosa è successo dopo? Siamo in un mondo nuovo, è cambiato qualcosa? È interessante quello che dicevi sul, sull'intimità e sul raccontare in prima persona, quanto, quanto abbia giocato anche il lockdown. Secondo te, tu che sei un grande scrittore di, di relazioni umane, che indaghi tutti i rapporti di coppia, di genitori figli, l'amicizia, credi che il dopo sarà diverso per, le, per il modo in cui costruiamo le nostre relazioni umane? Ha cambiato qualcosa? nel nostro modo sia di sentirle, di costruirle, ma anche di raccontarle, forse? I can tell you what happened to me during the, the COVID and, and, and about the dopo I, I will think while talking. I, I, first of all, uh, I wrote a lot uh, during the, the first, second and third lockdown in Israel. I came back in a very passionate way to storytelling. I felt that I need the story. Uh, nothing is happening in real life. Mm -hmm. It's complete silence, no book tours, no readings, and even the workshops are, were in Zoom, the writing workshops, which is depressing. <laughs> and the, the biggest drama in our family life was going to the supermarket. So I needed a story to happen. And I, so I, I started writing and I finished in five or six months a, a novel. Uh, I, I felt passionate and intense about writing. I think that, like I felt when I began my career, uh, like coming back to the starting point. And, and I felt that writing is also saving me. And if I look at this book, which is not yet published in Italy, it will be published in 2022, it's, it's the opposite of social distancing. Every, everyone is colliding with each other. So there's a lot of... Uh, passion, uh, violence, uh, conflict, sex, everything, everything that we were not able to, to uh, friendship, everything that we, we could not, that was deprived from us is happening in the book. I, I had to fill the gap. So coming back to your question about the dopo, I think if, if something, and we are now in Israel in a, in a certain feeling of a dopo, not yet, but maybe, And what I see around me is people just appreciating what, what they missed and, and passionately going after these things. I, like if I have, if two years ago a friend of mine would uh, tell me, come and, come and visit me, uh, I have a free morning and you have a free morning, it's an hour ride, and we can, but you can come and we will go to this uh, spring together, to this little uh, river. And I, maybe two years ago, I would say, oh, it's an hour's ride, I don't know. And my daughters, they need me, and I, yeah, um, I, maybe I would let it linger. And, 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 you know, it was two weeks ago, so I said, yeah, yeah, I will come, because who knows what will happen. You know, life is so shaky, we have this morning, we haven't met for a couple of weeks, then let's meet. So this is, this is how it affects me. I don't know how it will affect society and, and about writing, um, again, for me, when I look at this uh, book that I have written in Hebrew, it's like the COVID was, a, you call it a um, formative um, event. Uh, how do you call it, translate Mehorame Like something that is causing a change. So something caused a change in our life and shook whatever we were thought that is certain and when I look at this book that I have written during the COVID I f this is what ha is happening to the characters something really strong comes and shakes their lives and maybe before COVID I would think ah this is too dramatic I don't know I'm not a melodramatic writer but hey life is me melodramatic so why why not go to the edge when you're writing so I'm, I'm only, you know, uh, trying to um, reflect on my experience. I, I, I cannot be a prophet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. È interessante però questo come, come le situazioni in cui stiamo cambiano anche quello che raccontiamo. 
E tu prima citavi il modo di quanto sono importanti i desideri, gli spazi, per, soprattutto in un contesto come Israele. Tu hai una rubrica, credo su Vanity Fair, che si intitola Geografia delle emozioni. Quanto conta per te la geografia? Quanto è significativa la geografia nel pensare ai nostri desideri e alle nostre emozioni? First of all, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm in Italy um, and I've been here a lot recently. And it's this very strange feeling of um, finding that you have a second literary home away from home. Uh, my books are read here like they are read in Israel. And, and it's um, talking about geography, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience for a writer to be so well understood in, in, in not in his own language and not in his own culture. It's, it makes you wonder about how, how important is geography if we can cross the borders so easily. Or is it only Italians and Israelis? Are, are we that similar? Uh, So I, I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm, I'm coming here a lot. Uh, why do I feel so comfortable in Italy? Why, why, do my books, why are my books received so well here? Uh, so this is one thing that came to my, to my mind. Um, and about geography, I think I, I, when I write, I, f I have to feel a, little, a level of intimacy with the place I'm writing about. So I can feel intimate with Israel, of course. I can feel intimate with South America because uh, I, I wonder a lot. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I speak Spanish also. And I feel that Italy is really getting closer there. I'm getting closer. I can understand half of your questions already, uh, half of your, uh, your, your sentences. And I've been coming here s uh, um, a lot. So maybe, 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 maybe some of my My, my new book will have uh, scenes in Italy. And also in the, in the Vanity Fair column, I, uh, in a couple of, uh, I used this uh, opportunity, it was a very short text, very short stories. Cobelario de Desideri, Geografia de Emozioni. I used this uh, opportunity to write a little bit about Milano, a little bit about Rome, just to test whether I'm, I feel comfortable enough to take my characters to a, a scooter, a motorcycle ride in the streets of Milano. And is, is it, am, I, am I intimate enough with this city? Um, so uh, who knows? Who knows what will bring uh, the future? My, my next uh, book is happening in South America. And, um, and, and, and in Israel, in different places in Israel. Che effetto ti ha fatto vedere tre piani ambientato a Roma quando invece nel libro il contesto israeliano è così importante? Che effetto ti ha fatto? I, I was prepared because Nani eh, Moretti wrote me a very long email explaining in advance what kind of changes we really have to make in, in the book. He said in advance it has to be Italian. We have to connect the floors more And the whole aspect, uh, political aspect in your book, we can't do the same in Italy because it's not relevant for us. So I was really well prepared when the first I saw the movie. But still, I was astonished by how well dressed was everybody and how beautiful was this Roman building. Because the, I had in mind a very dull uh, bourgeois, but not uh, upper class uh, building in Israel, and, and my characters, I, I don't know, I don't imagine that they would look like Margarita Bui and, uh, and uh, Ricardo Scramaccio. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. So, so at first I was, I was astonished, and of course they, they speak Italian, they, and they speak, some of the dialogues are directly from my book, so it's kind of... But, you know, when I, I watched the movie already four times, and, and at, beginning from the second, starting from the second time, I felt that it's not really important, the, the whole uh, Italian uh, twist. What is important is the heart. The heart of the film is really close to the heart of the book because the, both the film and the book are talking about relationships, as you said, and specifically about the, the taboos in the relationship between the genitori and, uh, and children. 
And uh, in that sense, I think the, the movie is quite brave. I didn't see a lot of, definitely not American movies, but also not European movies tackling this issue in, in such a strong way. So, so in the end, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and also you gain something from this, um, you gain the actors, because you, I don't have actors in my books. I can't choose who is playing who. I can only imagine them. And, and when you get, um, right, let's take let Ricardo Scarmacho for, for an example. He's playing uh, uh, Arnon from the first floor. He's, in, he's called Lucho in the movie. He's bringing a certain energy to this character that, that is not exactly like the character in the book. And especially in the vulnerable, vulnerable moments that he has in this movie, it, it adds. Mm -hmm. Because you find yourself as a spectator, you find yourself kind of confused. Do I like him? Do I dislike him? Is he completely crazy? Or is he just a very good father? I'm not sure. And, and, and I think the thing that is are gained in, trans, in adaptation, in a way. Um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of WhatsApps from, from my friends in Israel because they are now the, the movie is out also in a in festival in Israel. So they are completely shocked by the fact it's Italian. <laughs> I, I, I got used to it already. <laughs> it's Italian. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, my mother and my father, they went to see the movie. Okay. It's very strange, very funny because my, my mother and my father always disagree about uh, everything and specifically about culture. They, as a child, they would go to a movie and, and I would be at home with a babysitter. Or I was the babysitter of my little brother. And I said, how was the movie? Never they would say the same thing, never. So they went to see Trepiani, uh, actually recently. And uh, so I, they sent me both WhatsApp, really long WhatsApps in, at the night after, but, but different WhatsApps separately. <laughs> So I read them in the morning. So my father says, ah, very good movie. I really like the way they transmitted the, the book. And it's so interesting. And, and, uh, and, and uh, cinematically, it's very impressive. Uh, I think it's a very good movie. The, the, the crowd uh, cheered uh, and applauded uh, at the end. And uh, it was uh, sold out. Uh, you should be very happy. This is my father. Mm. And then my mother, like a Jewish mother, <laughs> the book is better. <laughs> Ma senti, tu come scrittore, ragionando un attimo sulla tua scrittura, prima nominavi i tuoi studenti, perché tu sei anche un insegnante di scrittura creativa. In questo si, si divide un po' il modo di vedere la scrittura tra una scuola, se vuoi, più americana, dove la scrittura è tecnica, è artigianato, è insegnabile, è una scuola più europea dove la scrittura è ispirazione, vocazione, talento. Tu come stai qui in mezzo? Wow. Fascinating question. I understood, yeah, I understood. It's a fascinating question. I think what we try to do, and, and I, I hope we are successful in that because you should, you should Basically, you should ask this question to my students, yeah. and they should tell you what is their experience. But to begin with, we teach, I teach with, a, with a, my own lessons. We have a, a big school with a lot of teachers, but my own classes I teach with a partner, which is a poet. She's, she's female, she's a poet. So, so in advance, you already have two opinions, and she comes from poetry, so her whole way of thinking about text is different than mine. So, so this is something which is already democratic. And then we do try to give our students this kind of, a, I, I would say, a, a box of tools. But even on the first lesson, and, and we always say, we, okay, we, we summarize the first lesson. Usually my partner uh, does it, or wait, she does the summary. She said, okay, what have we, we learned today about the headline, the title of the first lesson is how to write truthful lies. Okay? And then she summarized. We learned about show, don't tell, and we learned about the importance of details, and we learned about, mm -hmm. and then at the end she said, but everything we learned today is not a Bible, is not something that uh, 
uh, you should immediately accept. It's not something which is uh, how to do or uh, this manual. It's, we will challenge everything that you think that is a rule. We will challenge during our workshop. And, and, and every text, we, sh we, we will have to invent new ways of reading it. And I think this is maybe the biggest challenge for me as a, as a teacher, and I've been teaching for 20 years now, to come to every text of, of my student as in a fresh way, as if I know nothing, as if I don't have all these concepts in my mind of how to write or what is good writing, just to see what, the, what is he or she, what do they want to do, and how can I help them? And to invent uh, this, this uh, the, the, the feedback again and again and again, not by a set of rules, but by what is right for them. And it's, it's, it, this is why I think it's a fascinating job. This is why I can do it for 20 years and I'm not less excited about it. I'm starting a new class soon and I'm, I'm completely excited about it as if it was my first class because who knows who will come, what will be the text, what will be the energy in the room. Una cosa bella dei tuoi libri che si capisce anche in quello che ci stai raccontando su come insegni è che i tuoi libri sono sempre uno spazio di libertà grande, di democrazia, di libertà in cui tutto, tutto può accadere. Nel Dizionario dei Desideri c'è un, un racconto che parte da un lemma che mi ha molto colpito, che era la F di ferita. E tu racconti in questo, in questo piccolo racconto, racconti la storia. Una, una situazione che può accadere in qualsiasi momento, una bambina che è al supermercato con il padre, a un certo punto si ferisce un dito e arrivano due ragazze che lavorano, due donne che lavorano al supermercato e le aiutano. La bambina è colpita alla fine la consolano, l'aiutano e dice parlavano in modo strano, erano arabe. Il padre gli dice sì sono arabe, lei ci pensa un attimo, interiorizza l'informazione e dice erano gentili. E tu all'inizio e alla fine del racconto ritorni su questa cosa e dici razzismo e antirazzismo sono parole grosse. Come se poi fosse attraverso i gesti che le cose passano, attraverso quello che fanno i personaggi, attraverso quello che noi facciamo nelle vite più che nelle parole. Ci pensavo perché ultimamente le, leggiamo spesso questo dibattito che un po' va sotto il grande nome della cancel culture in America, per cui sembra che le parole sono messe in questione, ci sono parole che possiamo dire, che non possiamo dire e, e da parte di molti scrittori c'è stata una sorta di allarme che la libertà degli scrittori di scrivere quello che vogliono che i libri non siano più uno spazio di libertà in cui scrivere, mostrare quello che vogliamo, mostrare i tabù, raccontare cose scomode. Cosa pensi tu? Pensi che quest queste questioni metteranno dei limiti alla letteratura? Andiamo verso un futuro in cui bisognerà stare più attenti a quello che si racconterà? First of all, it's interesting uh, to, to remember how did this piece that you described, the Ferita piece in, uh, in uh, the vocabulario de Desideri, how was it born? Uh, actually, the editor of uh, Vanity Fair asked me to write a special piece about racism. And I answered him, look, I don't write for themes or for requests or for special issues of a magazine. I write whatever I feel like writing. I can't do it. Just skip, skip one week. And, and after I said no, <laughs> I, feel, I felt liberated. <laughs> and I went to the supermarket with my daughter. And this actually happened. That what I'm describing there, she was actually helped by an Arab worker and then kind of for the first time in her very young life kind of who is she? Why does she look different? And what does it mean? And, and then I, I, I thought, yeah, I can write about these big words through a very intimate uh, situation. And, 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 and coming back to your question, I, for me, I, I don't really, I would try to not to use uh, aggressive words like I feel like using, but I, uh, I don't have, I, any other way saying it. I don't give a damn about all these kind of PC things happening in the United States. I don't give a damn because the, the, the whole idea of writing is challenging these politically correct borders. Why writing if you accept them? We, we I think artists always, always if you think of history, a history of art and, and the history of writers in my own country, 
always challenged what was perceived as the norm, what was perceived as okay or uh, correct. Uh, this, this is what I want to do as a writer. I, I, I would not obey any, any kind of censorship. We, in our country, there was a time a couple of years ago that we felt our, our, our government is trying to um, demand from artists a, a kind of loyalty to the, to the country. In, 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 in other words, not being critical on the government. And then we had a lot of protests about it and there was supposed to be a law of loyalty and we canceled the law. So for me, this, uh, this idea of the of democratic nature of writing is, is very, very strong. And, uh, and I would not um, uh, surrender to that in, in any sense, even, even if I pay the price. Uh, I have been encountering some strange responses from from United States specifically, mainly around this area of how could you, for instance, how could you as a man write from a perspective of a woman? Now, this is the whole idea of writing. This is the whole idea of reading, expanding your your views on life, being the other, being empathetic to the other. Why bother writing if you can only write about yourself and about who you are? The, the, I, I got this question in, a, in an event in the United States. I, you have in nostalgia, you have a Palestinian construction worker. Don't you feel that the fact that you are Jewish and, uh, you, uh, uh, prevents you from uh, writing this character? No, I don't. The opposite. I want to see the story of the 48 war. I have been taught this story so many times from the Zionist point of view. I know my own narrative by heart, but I want to, I want to change the perspective. I want to, how does it look from uh, on the eyes of a Palestinian child who is deported from his village in the 48 war? This is exactly what I want to do. So I don't, I don't need the permission of anyone. This is, this is art. So, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really holding myself not to use <laughs> bad words in Italian and English and Hebrew, but no, no way. Ti chiedo un'ultima cosa che ha a che fare con quello che ci stavi dicendo e anche un po' con i motivi per cui noi leggiamo, per cui avviciniamo i libri, ci piacciono le storie, alla fine ricerchiamo sempre le storie. A un certo punto in tre piani c'è un tuo personaggio la, la donna vedova che parla con la segreteria del marito e gli dice abbiamo sempre escluso troppo l'immaginazione dalle nostre conversazioni, abbiamo disprezzato l'immaginazione, abbiamo andato in esilio nella colonna penale l'immaginazione e in qualche modo questo è sbagliato. Qual è lo spazio secondo te oggi del, che abbiamo ancora per la nostra immaginazione? Le lasciamo abbastanza spazio? E in che modo il modo in cui noi coltiviamo l'immaginazione, poi affetta anche il nostro rapporto con i libri, con le storie, la nostra capacità di leggere. Can I add something about um, the question you asked before? Because I, one of the most strongest experience I, I had uh, during this uh, um, COVID time were, were demonstrations we had in Israel. And they were connected to this issue of, of democracy that we're talking about a lot in this conversation because we were afraid that uh, we, we, we had the same prime minister for many, many years and it was not, it was not changing and he became very strong and um, there was no opposition for, for quite a while and we, we were afraid that the country is not going to be democratic as it was. And the fear was so strong that it, it brought us to the streets. And I, I was completely involved. I was writing articles. I, I was speaking in demonstrations and paying the, the price you pay as an artist when you are politically involved. And it went on for a year. It was, it was quite a long, long journey. Um, Many of, you know, many of my friends said, you are crazy to do this, this won't help, he's too strong, he will never go away. And, but it was so important for me to, to, that my daughters would not grow up in a country that is like China or like Russia, that countries where you are afraid to speak what you, what you feel and what you think. 
and in the end, it was successful. In the end, we have a new government, and and uh, and it's I'm much more optimistic about my country than I was uh, half a year before. But if I connect to your question again, if it just you know, imagine the energy we put into this, and and of. Uh, and we had to do it because it was a political issue. But with art and with writing, it's much easier. If I don't want to be censored, and if I don't, and I'm not willing to accept the politically correct uh, uh, police, I just, the only thing I have to do is to write whatever I like. That's it. That's it. And that's what I'm going to do. So, question was about imagination, the place of imagination in, in our life. Um, reading. Kind of, we, we are coming back to the first, uh, we're closing the circle. Um, I think we, we, I can't imagine, uh, we're talking about politics now. So we have now a situation, a political situation in Israel that, that, that was completely imaginary. If you would tell me two years ago that in the government in Israel you will have an Arab party, part of the government, no way. Unbelievable. This is fantasy. This is uh, fiction by writers. And it, and it happened. So, and just think of the fact that Israel as a country started with a book by, by Herzl, which is called Alt Neuland. He had this fantasy about a country for Jews. Uh, and he wrote it in a book. Uh, it's, it's fiction. Uh, and, and this book was the starting point of Zionism. The Zionism led to the, to the fact that is, the Israeli country exists and, and, and this is why I'm sitting here and, and as an Israeli writer writing in Hebrew. So this all started with a book, with imagination. So if you grow up in this kind of country, how can you not believe in imagination? Um, for me, it was, I personally, it was, it, it's, it was always, as a child, it was always a, a huge part of my stream of consciousness it always was a huge part was imagination sometimes it was problematic and when I see my daughters like my little daughter had uh, an imaginary friend for a while and maybe some parents could be worried about it but actually I thought it's like it's beautiful it's a good sign if she can have an imaginary friend and hold on to this imaginary friend maybe it means that when she would need imagination in other times in life or and in tough moments in life, she will have to imagine something to look forward to, then she will be able to do it. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a strong believer in imagination. And who would, who would imagine that I would be sitting here in Italy <laughs> and uh, talking with uh, readers who have read all my books and uh, know how, what is the thread going uh, between them, you know? Crazy fantasy. Allora io ti ringrazio portandoci questo elemento dell'immaginazione, direi nel dopo, nel dopo verso il festival, ma anche nel dopo delle nostre vite e delle nostre vite di lettori, soprattutto. Grazie, Escol, e buonasera. <ride>